Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you choose to watch this video. I'm Chris Weber. I'm the pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church here in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm exhausted. And, and I don't say that for any sense of, of pity or sympathy. I, I say that because I imagine that many of you are feeling exhausted today. Life just doesn't seem to let up, right? With everything that's been going on with the pandemic and now the last few weeks as well, it has been exhausting and it's been hard. A week and a half ago, I recorded the video for last Sunday and I recorded that video earlier than I normally would. I recorded it and it was done on a Wednesday and I didn't have an opportunity to record anything else after that. So last when or last Sunday's video, excuse me, last Sunday's video, I don't regret anything about the content that was there. I do regret that that video was not more directly applicable to the situations that were at hand from what we were experiencing here in the Twin Cities. I imagine that many of you have been going through a lot internally and even externally as well. All sorts of different emotions, right? Frustration, anger, sadness, grief, and maybe the sense of just kind of clouded confusion. And I don't know about you, but maybe some of you, as I know I have, have experienced all those emotions sort of swirling around even in the course of one day. It's been a very difficult time and I, I do hope to address some of those issues that have gone on in the last week and a half in this video today because I think it's important to speak and to be open about these things, especially as the church. Today, in the midst of all that is going on, it is just as important as ever to remain grounded in who we are in Christ. And that's not only for the sake of our comfort of, of remembering the blessing of God in Christ, it is also for the sake of being reminded of the identity that we have in Jesus, because that identity shapes how we go about our life each and every day, even in times like this. And so I encourage you, as we have been doing, to stop whatever you're doing if you haven't already. Take a seat, and we're going to take some breaths today. Not just one, but we're going to stop, because I think we all could use it, and take a moment to just breathe, and then remember who we are in Christ. So if you're willing, please breathe with me. We are those who have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit blessed in grace by Christ, and blessed with a new identity. We're going to confess the Apostles' Creed, and as we do so, I want us to remember God is the creator of all things, of all people. His Son is redeeming all people, all in the world. His death on the cross, His resurrection was for everyone, and the Holy Spirit has been given to you and to me as the Holy Church to reveal that wonderful restoration and the fullness of humanity that Christ brings. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
A reading of Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Here ends the reading. To all of you children out there listening today, I brought something with me here. I brought a crown. And when you watch movies or TV shows or cartoons where there's people who have authority and people who have power that are ruling over their kingdoms, often they will wear a crown on their head as a way to show that they have this position of honor, they have this position of power, and that they're supposed to use that power to do something good and, and to care uh, for their kingdoms as they rule, right? Kings and queens are supposed to reign in a way that's loving and good. I mention that today because in the poem that we just heard, that poem writer reminds people that God has given them a crown. He's given them the blessing of being queens and kings, giving them this power and authority to look out at the world and to rule over it with his love and his mercy. But what's incredible about that poem is that that writer reminds us that it's not just one king and one queen. It's every single human being on the earth is blessed with that honor and glory to be kings and queens together. Everybody on the earth, God desires to be this great big group of kings and queens who rule over his world with love and mercy. And so I encourage you, if you have a crown in your house, toy crown, put it on today for a while. If you don't have one, make one and wear it for a little while as a reminder that God looks at you and sees you as queens and kings of his creation. But there's one more aspect of this that's really important and I want you to remember. After you wear that crown for a little while, take it off and give it to somebody else to wear. A mom, a dad, a grandparent, a sibling, a friend, if there's a, a good and safe way to do that. If you don't have a crown, you could also just make crowns for other people as a way to say, God's made us his kings and queens, and you're one of them too, along with all people. That's such a wonderful thing, and that's what Christ has come to do. Christ has come into this world, not only to reign as the king, but to empower us to be kings and queens with him, to work together with all people in order to... Uh, live in that wonderful honor and glory that God has given in Christ and that he's created us for. It's a wonderful joy, and I'm glad that I get to be a part of that with you all. For the rest of you out there today, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this last week and a half has been a huge swirl of emotions and intense experiences not only are we in the midst of a pandemic still, which is growing in parts of our country and especially in other parts of the world still, but now we are also in the midst of peaceful protests, not so peaceful protests, race riots, looting, more political unrest and upheaval as far as different groups in our country. There's so much going on in each of these things. Each of these things is so complex. There's no way that in this very brief video, I am going to be able to address the complexity of all of these issues. And I am not delusional enough to think that I have the capacity to do that. But I do want to speak to the issues that have been going on this week and a half and, and to try to recognize and acknowledge their complexity because complexity is important. important. Consider looting, for instance. It's been mentioned a lot in the news lately. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of desire to want to make this issue of looting really simple and cut and dry. 
frequently the way that happens is people will say, people are coming in from out of town and that's why there's looting, that's why there's problems. It's nobody local, it's other groups coming in. There is truth to that, but that's not the only reason why people are looting. There are looting from other groups that come in from out of town. There is looting that has taken place because some people just want their voice heard and they don't feel like they have been heard in what is going on in this country. There are others who feel deep oppression from our uh, capitalist economic system and so they loot certain stores as sort of a, a push against that capitalist structure. There are others who are at their wits end dealing with joblessness, financial loss or other loss and they want to try to get a leg up in the world and so they loot. And there's a whole host of other reasons. If we reduce it down to just one of those, we will never fully address the underlying issues that lead to moments like this. We have to let the issues be as complex as they are so that we can address them according to their complexity. And this isn't just about looting, right? This is about racism in our country. This is about political divide. This is about all sorts of different things that are happening and have been going on in our country and in our world as well. While I don't intend to address all of the minute complexities that are going on, what I want to offer to you today, and this might sound odd, but I, I want to offer to you my experience of reading Psalm 8 earlier this week. Psalm 8 is this beautiful poem of, of wonder and praise. The psalmist is outside underneath a, a night sky looking at the stars and the moon, the constellations, the vastness and beauty of the sky above. And the psalmist feels small and sees the smallness of all humanity in the midst of creation, but also is overwhelmed not just at the smallness, but that even though humanity is so small in the midst of this vast creation that God has bestowed honor and glory upon all humanity. All humanity is given dominion. All people, men and women around the world are given authority to rule over the creation. It's what God intended from the very beginning when he created people in his image. And as the psalmist puts it, you have put all things under humanity's feet. All things under humanity's feet. Birds, fish, animals, all things under his feet, but not people. That is immediately what I thought of when I read those words. You have put all things under humanity's feet, and my mind immediately said, not people. And that's the problem that we have in our world throughout history. God has bestowed all humanity with this blessing of honor and glory. He has created all people in his image, which means that they get to reflect God in his mercy and love to the world. They get to be God's ambassadors on this earth, reigning over the works of his hands. And this isn't whether you're part of the church or not. God reminds Noah after the flood, don't kill anybody because they are created in my image. It is still there after the fall. It is something that you and I and all people bear. We all bear God's image still today and are given that wonderful blessing of being able to reign. But the problem is we have this twisted tendency to not be content with what God has blessed us with. And we want something different or we want something more. This is what we see in the beginning of the scriptures and on. Adam and Eve are blessed with being able to reign over the entire creation, but they're not content with it. They want something more. They want to be like God, and so they eat of the fruit. Then what happens, right? Cain, not seeing his brother Abel as having that equal authority and honor and glory in this world, kills his brother Abel. Jacob steals from his own brother when he's starving. Jacob crawls into a tent and, and steals from his blind aged father. Jacob's 12 sons, right? 11 of them turn against one of their brothers and they want to step up above him. They are upset and angry with him and they want to oppress him and they sell him off as slavery into Egypt. 
the people of Israel eventually come to Egypt. And it's not in an instant decision that they all of a sudden become slaves. It's this historical process that takes place. These actions occur, these policies are put in place, this system is set up and different leaders come through and all of a sudden the Israelites find them in themselves in bondage. God releases them from that slavery, brings them through the Red Sea, and years later, what do they do? They start acting like Egypt. They start creating and using systems and policies in place to keep the poor poor and to keep those on the margins on the margins so that those in power that have status can maintain that power and status as well. This has been an ongoing problem throughout history for people, uh, whether they're part of God's people or not. And we see this in Jesus' day too. The religious leaders of Jesus' day didn't just borrow systems from their surrounding culture. They created their own that contributed to oppression. They weren't content simply looking at this clean and unclean laws as far as the way that God set them up, but instead they start applying them to people, pointing to the Gentiles as unclean and setting up a system that basically created physical distance and social distance between themselves and the Gentiles, which is not what God wanted. Every single moment of individual oppression matters. And it matters because it is an affront. It is an act of opposition against the very honor and glory that God has bestowed on every human being from the day they were created. But though every single moment matters and we should address the individual moments when they happen, if we don't ever step back... And look at the underlying systems and policies and, and kind of corporate, uh, not corporate, excuse me, but communal behaviors that we have that feed into these things and, and foster these sort of individual moments. We will never have the change that is really needed to help reveal and show to people in a, in a societal way that they matter. And that they have this wonderful honor and glory that is bestowed upon them in God. And this is, again, this is a problem. This is a worldwide problem. This is a problem that has gone on throughout time. That people have this tendency to want to protect their power, to protect their status, to protect whatever sense of safety they may have. And they are willing to push other people down to do so and to maintain that. But just because it is a long gone, a long, uh, 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 a long standing, excuse me problem throughout the world doesn't mean it still matters today. It is a problem today, and it is a problem in our country, specifically in our history towards black people, towards people of color, and towards indigenous people as well. That's our history. It is part, and it's not just about behaviors in the past. It has become part of our policies and systems over the years, at times intentionally, and maybe even at times unintentionally. But it continues to shape how these individual moments come about. Consider a few things for a moment. Children's shows, children's movies, they, they've gotten better in many respects, but there are stereotypes often woven into characters. And things like accents, this isn't an issue of um, black and white, for instance, in our, in our culture, but accents in children's shows, there's still this tendency to use like a Russian accent to depict somebody who's a villain. And it's not hard for children to move from thinking of Russian accent to thinking evil person or bad person, right? We are teaching our children at very young ages to think about people in healthy or in unhealthy ways. We have in our country systems at play that continue to foster disparities economically between people groups, that continue to foster disparities between job opportunities and the quality of health care that people have. We continue to foster disparities in education and the quality of education. We still have segregation in our cities. It's not based on drinking fountains, which is good that that's changed over the years. But I mean, consider even how we talk about locations in the Twin Cities. You compare North Minneapolis to Egan, for instance, or, or East St. Paul with West St. Paul. 
There are areas that we call the bad part of town. It's not hard to continue to slip into thinking, well, that means that's the bad people in town as well. We have power systems in our country that still are part of this system that is a problem as far as race goes, right? Our, our, our power systems have changed over the years a bit, but they are still dominated by, by white males. It's not just in our politics, that's in our own church body, of which I am a part of. I am not ashamed of who I am. But if I don't acknowledge that I am a part of a system that is functioning in that way, then I can never change or do what needs to be done to help foster change in that system for the good of others. We often want to label these issues of being an issue of the right or an issue of the left or it's this group's problem or it's not my individual behavior. We have to be able to step back in the complexity of all that's going on and look at what's underneath and see that this is our systems. These are our policies and we have to take ownership for the things that go on so that we can take ownership for the change that is so badly needed. This psalm, Psalm 8, in the midst of all of these broken policies and systems, and not just in our country, but that have gone on for centuries around the world, this psalm invites us to stand together as humanity in awe and wonder of the God who created the vastness of the cosmos and looks at the smallness of all humanity and gives to us all authority to reign as his queens and kings, to, to give us his honor and glory so that we can foster spaces and opportunities for people and the whole creation to thrive as we all work together as his human creatures. This psalm invites us into that place of wonder to see all people as bearing this blessed gift of being queens and kings in this world. And as we stand and wonder in the midst of the words of this psalm, the psalm urges us to see not only humanity, but Christ in the midst of it and at the center of it. The Son of God comes into this world wrapped up in humanity, skin and all, in order to bring restoration to all humanity. And not only does he bring restoration, but we get to see what the full intent of humanity was supposed to be and is still supposed to be in Jesus. He enters into the world and he doesn't just bring forgiveness of sins as good as that is, but he, he, works, that, um, he, he works in order to stand in opposition to and, and unravel the broken systems that are at play. For instance, in Jesus' day, it was very common that if you were a person of some sort of status, you would keep inviting people to your house who are of that status or of that wealth or a little bit up so that you can keep your position in society. And what does Jesus tell people in the midst of that system? Don't invite your rich neighbors. Instead, invite the poor. Invite the marginalized. Invite those who offer and give you nothing in return. Because that's how the kingdom of God works. God wants people to acknowledge the shared honor and glory we have with all people. And to work together to reign in his world. And Jesus does that. He comes to embody the fullness of that humanity. He brings forward a new way of being for us. He brings forward a new way of being that doesn't only challenge political systems, but also religious patterns that are at play, too. Again, the religious leaders of Jesus' day set up a system in which they basically pushed away the Gentiles and kept a huge distance physically and socially and economically away from the Gentiles. But that's not what Jesus wants. So Jesus steps into that and he starts to welcome Jews and Gentiles men and women, young and old, and he gives himself for all. It's why he shows up. Jesus enters into the world to show the fullness of humanity. And as he is revealing the fullness of what it means to be human, 
he is put to death by an oppressive Roman system. Deemed not worthy to live, dehumanized on a cross. But God raised him up. God raised his son from the dead and has given him all honor and glory. And God is putting all things under his feet. He is doing what God intended to do with Adam and Eve and every single human being since to give that honor and glory and that authority. But now Jesus is Lord over all and we're waiting for the day where that last enemy, death, will finally be put under his feet. And that's important to remember that the last enemy is death. People, people are not the enemy. Death and sin and evil in this world are but people. No, what God wants to do with people is that as Christ is reigning over heaven and earth today, he doesn't want to just simply restore people as he is doing with you and me and as he desires to do with the world. No, he wants us to reign with Christ. He is restoring what he intended to do with Adam and Eve from the very beginning. That role that people have in this world of being kings and queens is being restored in Christ. And we are gifted with the Spirit to be able to take part in that reign with Christ today. We are called in the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, to reveal to the world that honor and glory that they have been created in, in God, and that is being restored to them in Christ. We get to reveal that God desires us to work with all people together as fellow kings and queens to, to reign in this creation. This congregation, I know, has been doing that in different ways over the years, and I'm so thankful for that. And I have seen church bodies around the world doing that and other people in societies working towards those things as well. And it's good and it's beautiful. But my hope is not that we would uh, feel shame about where we are or feel like we've failed miserably in all of these things. No, I, I want us to see, though, that we need to step back at times, too. And there are still some very deep systemic problems that are going on that continue to foster disparities between people groups in our country and in our world. And we need to let those situations be the complex issues that they are. But we must not shy away from them. We need to keep moving towards them. And again, I, I trust that, that you have been doing that in ways. And I am joyful and trust that God will continue to do that. But we have to continue to be intentional about it. We cannot slip into indifference or apathy. The Spirit is given that we would continue to be able to address not individual moments that pop up, though we can and should do that. But to step back and to walk like Christ to live in a way that also stands in opposition to systems, not, in a, not necessarily in a, a, a way that is, again, opposed to Christ, but a way that follows in his way of love and mercy and seeks to bring about the, the revelation that Christ desires to see that all people share in that honor and glory and that all people are being restored in him. I'm so thankful again for what you do. And I'm so thankful and joyful to look forward to the days ahead of what Christ can and, and will do through us. So let's continue to work in his ways. Let's pray. Lord, you've blessed us in a way that at some times overwhelms us. You've given us as human beings dominion and authority to reign over the works of your hands. And even though we had turned away from you, you've placed Jesus in authority and restored humanity in him for us and for all people. Teach us to rejoice in that restoration. But teach us not only to rejoice, but also to grow in our ability to embody that restoration and the desire for how you would like us to reign with all people in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Every life matters to you, God, but in our country, we have a history and we have a pattern of dehumanizing, especially blacks, indigenous, and people of color. Help us to own our systems and policies so that we can, in fact, change them, 
to better manifest your blessing of honor and glory on all people. Lord, in your mercy, let the cries of justice be heard. We do pray for the riots and protests to stop, but we pray that they would stop because they have been heard and change would be enacted in a way that is good in your eyes. Do not let us slip into apathy. Do not let us slip into indifference in the days and weeks and months ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for safety still for all of our communities and for those who work to foster safety at day and at night. Give them confidence and joy in the support they offer to all. Lord, in your mercy. The pandemic has been hard enough, Lord, and, and now there's further job loss and business destruction. Help those who are in dire straits today. Provide finances where needed, food where there is lack, compassion where there is pain, and use us in these matters as well. Lord, in your mercy. All of these issues are complex, and there are so many more that continue to go on in this world. The pandemic growing in South America and in Africa, protests for women in Nigeria, the oil spill in Russia, protests in Mali. As we live and work in and for all these various situations, and as your church around the world seeks to move in the spirit into these situations with your love and mercy, continue to remind us that our work in you is not in vain, that it will not be wasted. Remind us of the promise that Christ will return, restore all things, and that when he does, the work that we have done in him today will somehow be a part of that beautiful day. Remind us again and again, our work today in the Spirit will not be wasted in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting in your promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I pray again that this video finds you well wherever you are and I, I pray that these again, are not words of, of shame and guilt, but words of encouragement as we continue to walk in the Spirit and to address the very real circumstances that are in our life today. Uh, I do want to make one uh, brief announcement, and that is that in the next week, uh, there's going to be a survey coming out to the congregation. It's a short survey. It should only take just a handful of minutes, maybe four or five minutes. But please take the time to look at that survey and to fill it out. The survey will be anonymous, so you are free to include whatever information you want there with anonymity. But I want you to fill that out, not simply so we can get a sense of, of, of where you are at as, as far as what this experience has been like with videos and, and with our experiences of worship in our space when we return of what that will be like. It's not just about hearing what it's like for you or what you desire, but we're going to take those surveys and use them as part of a process to figure out how we can better improve what we're doing and how we can best move forward. So please, please, again, when you see that survey, take a moment, fill it out, and send it in. Um, it will be a, a great help to us as we make plans for where we are headed today and into the future. I do want to say just one other thing. There again is a ton going on in life right now. And these are not small situations. These are large situations. And, and they also may very well involve a lot of other personal things for you. Feelings of sadness, feelings of isolation, and all sorts of other things. If you want to talk with me or somebody else, please do so. I encourage you, don't go this time alone. Please reach out, call me, email me. You can go to our, uh, our website and on that homepage there, there's a place to fill out for a prayer request. There's also a contact section on our website if you'd like to send an email to me. 
Um, again, don't go it alone. We need each other, not only as we are connected in Christ, but to enact that connection through phone calls, through emails, through other ways that we can connect. So please, again, in the midst of all of this very stressful and challenging time, do not go it alone. I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. I pray that the Lord would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And that the Lord would look upon you with favor and give you his peace. As we continue to live in the wonder that we and all people are created in honor and glory to share in dominion, which is being restored in Christ. Please continue to stay home if you are able and in the interactions that you choose to make, be wise about them in the context of the still ongoing pandemic that we are in. If you are working or going back to work, please continue to do so in a way that seeks to bring love to your neighbor through that work. We, we pray for your safety as well. Stay connected together. Again, we don't go this alone. We are bound up in Christ, but seek out ways to show that love and connection to one another. And until we get to see each other again, I pray you have a very blessed week.